the Arctic Ocean, unlike any other marine environment on Earth, home to species found nowhere else on the globe. Walrus, polar bear, ice seals and whales, the culturally vital eider duck, the ecologically important polar cod, and thousands of microscopic life forms still being discovered. This is a system that has evolved in cold water and ice. When those elements are not there, life becomes unpredictable. The Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program, or CBMP's State of the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Report, tells us about the changes occurring in Arctic marine ecosystems based on information from existing biodiversity monitoring programs, and also what we're able to say about current biodiversity monitoring efforts. How is the Arctic marine environment changing? What about the species that live there? What challenges do they face and why? What are our biodiversity monitoring programs able to tell us? Right now, we don't have all the answers. Far from it. We are struggling to understand a system when it is the most dynamic it has ever been. It is a moving target. This is why it is so important and challenging to monitor and interpret changes underway in the Arctic marine environment. By investigating the animals, plants, and ecosystems of the Arctic, the CBMP is trying to equip policy and decision makers with the information they need in order to conserve and sustainably manage Arctic biodiversity. This is their first in-depth marine report. Food resources are being lost for many Arctic marine species. Many species must travel further and expend more energy to feed, leading to concerns about individual health and potential effects on population. For example, reduced ice cover has led to polar bears feeding on eiders and murres, potentially leading to local population declines in the birds. Uh, polar bears have shown up even on mur colonies. Now these are cliff nesting birds, so the, when the bears show up, they disturb the birds, the birds fly off. So that not only means that the bears are going after the chicks and eggs that they can get on the cliffs, but when the adult birds leave, uh, because they've been startled by the bear, the other predators like uh, gulls will come in and, and attack the unprotected eggs and chicks. So it's not just what the bears eat, but the disruption in the colony as well. Arctic species are shifting their ranges northwards to seek more favorable conditions as the Arctic warms. Northward expanding Cape Lynn has led to changes in seabird diet in northern Hudson Bay and may also affect marine mammals. But warming can have contradictory and surprising effects on some species. Increased temperature around Svalbard has seen more southern copepod species of unknown nutritional value to Arctic feeders while rising temperatures in the Chukchi Sea has been associated with an increase in large nutritious copepods. What we've been finding is I've, uh, my samples have been taken from pretty much the circumpolar region, is that there are, is no one Arctic. Every single part of the Arctic behaves a little bit differently. And what the, worry, the most worrying thing to me is that someone sees an event they put that into a model and they extrapolate to the rest of the Arctic, which is not an accurate uh, way of, of uh, predicting what's going to go on. We need more information so that we can have region-specific predictions of whether this region is going to be better for one sort of plankton and the other region is going to be better for another sort of plankton. And this has impacts all the way up to the food, food uh, chain and to uh, seals and mammals and and other large organisms who are actually dependent on the kind of phytoplankton and production that's going on in their region in over a certain period of time. So what the, my big worry really is that uh, by simplifying the system and not having enough data, those nuances, those, those small differences regionally will be, um, uh, they're lost. This northward movement is easier for more mobile open water species compared to those linked to shelf regions, like many benthic species. So the changes we, that we see in the benthos is relating to environment, for example, increasing temperature, and that they, they start to move. And they are moving because they want to 
be inside an environment that is the best for them. So those who cannot move, those, for example, that is sticked to a stone, they are dying, but they still can send their larvae on in the current and they can continue to other areas and then re-establish new population. So this is changing that we see in the Arctic with, with the bentos, that species is actually moving or spreading. Increasing numbers and diversity of southern species are moving into Arctic waters. In some cases, they may outcompete or prey on Arctic species or offer a less nutritious food source. For example, in the Atlantic Arctic, Atlantic cod is increasing predation pressure on polar cod, an important fish eaten by other fish, birds, and mammals, especially seals. Changing benthic biomass in the Barents Sea is related to, amongst other pressures, warming waters, which improve conditions for boreal species to move further north. What's special in the Barents Sea is that we have, uh, it's a transition zone between Atlantic and Arctic. And with the warming, we see that a lot of the Atlantic species is uh, moving further north, especially during summer, because they, a lot of them are seasonal migrating species. And there they overlap with the Arctic species, like polar cod. Um, and many of the Arctic fish species are quite small. And many, many of these migrating uh, Atlantic species are bigger, so they can prey on the smaller species, so they will uh, so what we see is that the food web is changing. So you get, in a way, a different trophic structure and different feeding relationships. So the interactions are changing. So apart from the abiotic, uh, like the environmental factors are changing, but also the interactions are changing. So the whole, that changed the whole dynamics of the system. That's what we think might happen. Current trends indicate that species reliant on sea ice for reproduction, resting, or foraging will experience range reductions. Arctic sea ice is a habitat at risk. Ice-associated amphipods have declined around Svalbard since the 1980s, and it is possible that sea ice algae community structure has changed in the central Arctic. These changes are possible elsewhere, but these species are not covered under existing monitoring programs, so it is hard to say with certainty. The changes that I've seen in the ecosystem is very much attached to the change in the sea ice, going from the thick multi-year ice to the first year ice. And I've seen these, some of these dramatic changes that, uh, for instance, uh, Russian colleagues have seen over longer periods of time that I worked in the Arctic, things are happening very fast. I don't think most people realize how fast the climate warming is affecting Arctic sea ice and the sea ice ecosystem. Uh, I never thought I would see this in, in my kind of short lifetime as a researcher, but uh, I think I will see an ice-free Arctic Ocean before I'm done with my research career. Морских млюктающих, прежде всего для белого медведя, основную угрозу представляет потепление климата и связано с ним изменение в ледовом покрове. Ледовый покров отступает все далее в приполесные районы, а это глубоководные районы менее благоприятные для добычи основных видов жертв белого медведя. Это накладывает дополнительный стресс на это животное. И, конечно, для ряда других морских мультаж, например, для кочетонер, потепление климата и изменение в ледовом покрове также представляет одну из основных угроз. Но помимо этого, конечно, деятельность человека неизбежно будет вести к, к такому мощному воздействию на популяции морских мультаж белого медведя. Это прежде всего, конечно... Some Arctic breeding seabirds and marine mammals have been observed shifting behaviors. Harp seals in the Northwest Atlantic have been having less pups. In the Barents Sea, they have a lower body condition, and also in the Barents, bearded seals are changing what they eat. Belugas in Hudson Bay have been changing the timing of migration in response to temperatures. 
Reduced ice means ringed seals may have a harder time having and raising pups. Without ringed seals, the polar bear is less able to rebuild energy stores after their own breeding time. Walrus normally rest on ice directly located over their food, but with ice reductions, they increasingly use coasts to rest. So not only do they have to travel further for food, but they also run the risk of calf mortality from stampede events on shore. In Svalbard, the archipelago, where I do most of my high Arctic work, we've had dramatic collapses of sea ice. Up until 2005, we had status quo running research programs as we had for decades. And in 2006, west coast and north coast, there was no sea ice. Just suddenly, unpredicted, unprecedented collapse in sea ice. And it really hasn't recovered. So we're seeing profound changes, many of which are quite difficult to document because the traditional tools available to us, like flying surveys at molting to count seals on sea ice, are obviously no longer possible without sea ice. But things are really dramatic. We see massive behavioral changes in ring seals tagged before the sea ice collapse and after the sea ice collapse. We see that they're living in a very, very different world. They still travel to the summer sea ice that they used to occupy, but they have to travel much, much further. They're not doing area restricted search anymore because it doesn't seem like they find food concentrations the way they did before. They're diving deeper and for longer and resting less, all of which means, of course, it costs much more to get the food that you require. And that will eventually have reproductive consequences and growth consequences for these animals. And you see that kind of phenomenon in many different species right now. So we're quite concerned, very concerned, about the future of all of these ice-affiliated Arctic endemics. Increases in the frequency of contagious diseases are being observed. Avian cholera has increased in the Arctic archipelago and northern Bering Sea. Seals and walruses, essential foods for indigenous communities, experienced an unusual mortality event in the Pacific and Beaufort in 2011, affecting not only the species themselves, but the health, nutrition, cultural, and economic well-being of many communities in Canada, the U.S., and Russia. So for the Inuit culture, it's very much part of the ecosystem. So when we talk about walrus, we have to understand how many young boys have to go out that year to hunt, to be taught for the first time. And when they catch a walrus, they have to come back and give it to their elder. And this is the mark of the first time that they make a transition from being provided for to being a provider within their community. And that roots a lot of self, uh, self identity. So there's this very large connection um, that that you have to be able to see where all of these points are connected to each other and understand that if one piece changes, so for example, the benthic species distribution is changing in that area right now, it affects the walrus, but it also affects that young boy and it affects all the people that are meant to come together to process the walrus at the same time. And it affects an opportunity to transfer knowledge from one generation to the other during that season and to develop your relationship um, to understand what, who you are and become aware of yourself within your environment. Arctic marine species and ecosystems are undergoing pressure from cumulative changes in their environment. Some changes may be gradual, but some may be large and sudden and affect how ecosystems function. It is hard to determine where and when these tipping points exist because the variety of stressors and subsequent reactions can interact in complex and surprising ways. For those charged with managing natural resources and public policy in the region, it is crucial to identify the combined effects of stressors and potential thresholds to effectively prepare for an uncertain future. You know, it's a system that's experiencing rapid change. We're seeing, uh, you know, pollution is, being, is accumulating there. We're seeing uh, changes in, the, in ice extent temperatures are warming, we're getting nutrient changes as well, and it's, it's, it's just so dynamic. Um, and yet it's, it's one of these, you know, it's, it's a rare treasury left on Earth that we haven't done a lot to yet. You know, we can get an appreciation for, for what 
may be driving some of those processes and you know, it's an opportunity to change the way we interact with the ecosystem to you know, minimize our impact and uh, use the ecosystem in different ways than you know, just traditional resource extraction. So we can see it as a complicated, incomplete picture. But despite this, we know enough to act. We can take measures to ensure that these species and environments persist under changing circumstances for the benefit of future generations. Importantly, we must invest in biodiversity monitoring programs. This will not only help us better understand what is happening to the species and environments that Arctic peoples and the world depend on, but it will also help us know what effect our management actions have. Without these beacons, we wander in the dark, but with them, there is knowledge and opportunity. So the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program, with uh, this first State of the Arctic Biodiversity Report, now have a comprehensive overview of the monitoring that are going on in the Arctic countries. With this overview, we can now make a picture of some of the most important trends uh, on some of the focal ecosystem components or the, eco the indicators for some of these changes that are going on in the Arctic.